ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday at 4 Eastern time. I'm in New Orleans. The summer is coming. That means it's hot. It's time for hot technologies. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I'll be your host. I'm going to take the ball back here for hot technologies. The topic today is forward momentum, moving relational beyond traditional. Folks, we have three database experts on the phone today. So any questions you have, send them the hard ones. Don't be shy. We have a bunch of good content lined up for you today. There is a slide about yours truly and enough about me. Of course, this year is hot. We're talking all about hot technologies in this show, which is a partnership with our friends from Techopedia. And we're going all the way down to the foundation of information management today, which of course is the database. We're gonna talk about how we got here, what's happening today, and what's happening going forward. Lots of very interesting stuff going on. Obviously, we have some serious innovation in the database space. It was kind of quiet for a while. If you talk to some of the analysts in the business, I would say probably from the year like 2005 to 2009 or 10, it didn't seem like there was too much going on in terms of innovation. Then all of a sudden it just broke out like a jailbreak or something, and now there's all kinds of interesting stuff happening. So a lot of that is because of the scale of the web and all the cool web properties that are doing different interesting things. That's where the NoSQL concept came from. And that means two different things. It means NoSQL as in it doesn't support SQL. It also means not only SQL. There's a term new SQL that some people have used. But obviously SQL, the, the structured query language, really is the foundation. It's the base of querying. And it's interesting that all these NoSQL engines, what happened? Well, they came out. There's a lot of excitement about it. And then a few years later, what did we all start hearing? Oh, SQL on Hadoop. Well, all these companies started slapping SQL interfaces onto their NoSQL tools, and anyone who is in the programming world knows that's going to lead to some challenges and some difficulties and some crossed wires and so forth. So we're going to find out about a lot of that stuff today. So there are our three presenters. We've got Des Blanchfield calling in from Sydney, our very own Robin Bloor, who's in Texas, and so is Bert Scalzo. He's in Texas as well. So first of all, we'll hear from Des Blanchfield. Folks, we will treat it the hashtag of hot tech, so feel free to send your comments or send your questions through the Q&A component of the webcast console or even through the chat window. And with that, Des Blanchfield, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. So I'm gonna try and set the scene uh, at a 30,000 foot point of view of kind of what's happened in the last decade. and. Uh, the, the significant shifts we've seen, well, at least a decade and a half anyway, of um, the, the database management systems and some of the impacts from a commercial or a technical point of view and some of the trends that we've uh, endured of late and lead us into the, the conversation we're about to have uh, today around the topic. So my cover image here is um, a sand dune and there's wind blowing uh, tiny little bits of sand off the top of it. And as a result of that, what happens is that sand dune slowly walks from one space to another. Uh, this is this amazing phenomenon where these, these massive 40 and 50 foot high uh, mountains of sand effectively, they actually move and they move very slowly, but they move surely. And as they move, they change the landscape. And it's quite something to watch if you spend any time at all in an area where sand dunes are a natural uh, thing because you can look out the window one day and realize that this, this, this massive mountain of, of uh, sand, little tiny grains, has moved all by itself uh, in effect and that the wind slowly shifts it from one place to another. And I think in many ways uh, that's been the, the uh, world of database systems for quite some time until very, very recently that very small shifts in the form of sand grains moving a a giant mountain of sand in the form of a, a, sand, a dune, sand dune. Um, little, little shifts have come into the database platforms over the years, and it's, it's been a fairly stable and, and uh, solid environment around uh, database and, and database uh, systems and platforms, you know, through the, the mainframe and the mid-range era. Um, but of late, we've had some fairly significant things happen to uh, our uh, commercial needs and our, our technical drivers, uh, and I'm going to walk us through those. Um, so I, I have a view that the basic concept of a, a database as we knew it for, for many, many years, and as you may have heard in the pre-show banter, uh, uh, two experts who are on the call with me today uh, have had a lifetime in this space, and they were uh, uh, quite rightly uh, sharing bragging rights of, of being there uh, when it all started in the early 80s. But we've seen this massive shift in the last decade and a bit, and I'm going to quickly walk us through uh, 
the short hand over to Dr. Robin Bloor. Um, we've been through this, what I call bigger, better, faster, cheaper experience. Um, as I said, the, the definition of a database has changed. So the landscape in which the database platforms have had to uh, address performance and, and technical and commercial uh, requirements has, sh has shifted as well. We've seen this increase uh, in demand for solutions to deal with either more complex commercial or, or, or more complex technical requirements. And so it, a really quick walkthrough, what that actually means in, in my mind is that you know, we got to sort of the 90s and we saw database technology impacted by uh, the introduction of the internet and kind of what we called back then the internet scale uh, and that you know we weren't just talking about people sitting in front of terminals um, you know originally the likes of uh, teletype terminals with, with uh, physical printers built into them and 132 columns of text coming out of paper then uh, you know the early uh, green screen terminals punching away keyboards um, but you know our world was terminals and, and, and serial cables or network cables talking to computers for a long time and then along came the internet and and this explosive uh, growth of connectivity that you didn't have to be plugged into the computer anymore. To get to a database system, you just needed a web browser. And uh, so database technology had to dramatically uh, change to deal with the scale uh, of, of uh, you know, everything from the basic search engine technologies that were used to index the world and, and, store, them, and store and index that information in some form of database format scale and people like Google and, and others uh, provided a platform to do that and all new types of database storage and query and indexing was produced. And then we had uh, you know, music sites and movie sites come along. And then in the 2000s, we, we saw the dot-com boom and that produced an even uh, more dramatic explosion in the number of people using systems that were invariably powered by a database of some form. Uh, at this stage, relational databases still coped with most of the load. We just put them on bigger tin, and we kind of went to uh, some very, very, very big mid-range systems running uh, Unix platforms from, from people like IBM and Sun and so forth. The dot-com boom just made things bigger and, and faster from a hardware performance point of view, and, and there were some significant changes in the, the database engine, but for, for the better part, it was still the same thing we'd kind of seen for a long time. Uh, and then we, we got this era of Web 2.0, as we refer to it, and um, this was a, a monstrous shift because all of a sudden we needed much simpler database platforms, uh, and they had to be able to scale at a horizontal form. And um, uh, that, was, that was kind of was such a significant shift in the, in the way that we, we approached the idea of what a database was that we're still really catching up now, in my view. Uh, and now we're dealing with this whole quagmire, and I say that with a positive spin, not a negative con uh, connotation. This quagmire of what we refer to as big data and, uh, and, and, a, and a, an enormous explosion, um, uh, and I mean explosion, of just this, this outrageous shift vertically on the graph of the number of options we have um, when we talk about a database um, and, and some form of relational uh, querying capability. And uh, interestingly enough, I'm personally of the view that I, I think that big data really is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we, we, we do tend to get a little bit excited about what the impact of big data has been and the, the types of choices that we have available now. We've got everything from, you know, uh, no SQL engines, we've got graph engines, we've got all these different types of uh, platforms that we can throw data at and, and do things with it, even to the point where, in fact, uh, one of the very first conversations I had with uh, Eric um, Kavanaugh, who's, who's here with us today, um, was around a conversation uh, pertaining to a thing called Apache Drill, which is an open source project that allows you to uh, query data inside uh, uh, multiple different data types, everything from raw CSV files um, sitting on a hard drive through to uh, uh, HDFS file systems at, uh, at petabyte scale. And, uh, you know, it allows you to do these, these SQL-style queries of, of uh, structured and unstructured data of all kinds of exciting types. But we're about to see smart buildings uh, become a thing, uh, and, and we, we like to think we've got smart buildings of security and heat management, but I'm talking about smart buildings that know a lot more about who you are and where you are when you walk in and, 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 and do all kinds of neat things at that level, uh, through to smart cities, entire ecosystems at city level that, that know how to do things intelligently. And uh, beyond that, we've got this, this incredible thing that I don't think anyone in the world's fully grasped, and that's the form of the Internet of Things. So there's, there's been all these different changes through the last decade and a bit, maybe two decades roughly if we round it up, that have sort of just impacted the world of what we consider databases, in my view. Um, there's been a couple of uh, significant things that have, that have made this even possible. The cost of hard drives has come down dramatically, um, and uh, in many ways that's what made it possible to drive some of the, the 
reference architectures such as the Hadoop model in that we take lots of data and spread out on lots of hard drives and do smart things with it. Um, and in effect, what became sharding in the, uh, in my view, in the relational database or traditional DBMS model. Um, and RAM got very, very cheap. And that gave us a whole new opportunity to play with different reference architectures, uh, such as in memory, uh, and, and to do things like petitioning very, very large amounts of data. Um, and so this gave us um, this little picture that we're looking at now, which is the, the, uh, a diagram that shows uh, the types of platforms that are available if you're in the big data landscape. Uh, and it's, it's very, very difficult to read. And the reason for that, there's just too much information on there. There are so many uh, make, model, and manufacture options of, of ways to put data into database systems of any form and query it and, and do the traditional read writes. And they're not all ASCII compliant. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and in fact, very few of them even comply to any basic ANSI 92 style standard, uh, but they still consider themselves to be a database. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of screens in a second to give you some context around uh, what I mean by the shift from the sort of the, the 90s and the internet scale to Web 2.0 and then sort of the whole uh, uh, growth through big data. So if we think that this big data technology landscape graph uh, is exciting because there's a lot of options on it, uh, let's just have a look at one key vertical. So let's look at marketing technology. Here are the options for database management systems or, or data management inside just the MarTech space, the technology related to marketing. Now this was in 2011, so this is a few years ago, five years ago, this is what the landscape looked like. So if I just go back one slide briefly, this is what today's big data landscape looks like in the, the various brands and offerings we've got in, in database technologies. This is what one vertical looked like five years ago just in marketing technology. Now if I go to today's view, this is what it looks like and it's completely impenetrable. It's just this wall of brands and options uh, and it's thousands and thousands of combinations of software that considers itself to be uh, in, the, in the database class that it can capture, uh, uh, create, or store, and retrieve data of various forms. And I think we're entering a very, very interesting and brave time now where once upon a time you could know the major brands. You could know the five or six different platforms from Oracle and Infomix and DB2 and so forth and be almost an expert in all of the brands that are available some 20 years ago. Ten years ago, that little, they got a little bit easier because some of the brands fell off and, and not all the brands could cope with the scale of the, the dot-com boom and some companies just went broke. Today, it's absolutely impossible to be an expert in all the database technology that exists, whether it's relational databases or standard database management platforms that we've come to know over the last couple of decades, or uh, more likely the case, the more modern engines like Neo4j and, and uh, those types. And so I think we're in a very brave world where a lot of options are available, and we've got uh, platforms that can scale on a horizontal basis, either in memory or on disk now. Um, but I think it's a, a challenging time for, for uh, technology and business decision makers because they they need to make some very big decisions on technology stacks that in some cases have only been around for, for essentially months. Uh, you know, 18 months old is not uh, a scary number now for some of the, the, the more exciting and new open source database platforms and, and they start to, uh, to, to, to merge platforms and become uh, even newer and, and more exciting. So I think we're going to have a great conversation today about how this all has impacted the traditional database platforms and how they're responding to it and the types of technologies that are being thrown at that. And with that in mind, I'm going to uh, pass uh, now to uh, Dr. Robin Bloor and uh, get his insights. Robin, over to you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, yeah, um, this is way too large a topic. I mean, if you just took a sliver of um, uh, one of the um, uh, illustrations that Des just showed you. You could have a long conversation just about one of the slivers. <clears throat> but you can, you know, you can go at database. I've been looking at database, uh, um, I don't know, since, in the, since the 1980s. And you, you can look at database in different ways. And one of the things that I figured that I would do just throw into the conversation today was to talk about the recent disruptive things that have happened at the level of hardware. Um, and you have to bear in mind that an awful lot of disruptive things have actually happened at the level of software as well. So this is not the full picture of anything. This is just a hardware thing. <clears throat> I wasn't going to talk for particularly long either. I just wanted to give you the hardware picture. A database was 
data re retrieval capability, spanning CPU, memory, and disk, uh, and that's changing dramatically. And the reason that I say that was was that I learned to understand database from the perspective of what you actually did. You know, there's a difference in latency between data actually on the CPU and data being pulled into the CPU from memory and data being pulled from disk into memory and through the CPU. And, and the old database architectures were just trying to balance that. You know, they were just saying, well, disk goes very slow. We'll cache the data on the disk so it's in memory. We will try and do that in a really accurate way so that a really good proportion of the data we ask for is already in memory. Um, and we will, you know, we'll march the data onto the CPU as fast as we actually can. You know, and <coughs> databases were written in the old days for SMP machines. They're written for small clusters. Uh, and therefore, they weren't um, ignorant of parallelism because if you're going to get um, some performance out of a cluster, you have to do various things in parallel. Um, so parallelism is a part of the game, but it, nothing like the way it is now. So I'll just kind of walk through what happened. First of all, disk. Well, disk is over, really. Um, it's pretty much over as regards databases. I, I think that um, there are a number of contexts to archiving of data and even, you know, very dark, large data, uh, data lakes running on Hadoop the where spinning disk is probably viable nowadays, but really the problem with spinning disk was that the read speeds didn't improve particularly much. You know, when when um, CPU was going up at um, uh, Moore's Law speeds, kind of, you know, uh, order of magnitude faster every six years. And um, uh, memory was kind of following in its way, then those two were reasonably keeping pace with each other. It wasn't entirely smooth, but they did. But, you know, the random read to a disk where the head flies about the disk, I mean, apart from anything else, it's a physical movement. And, um, you know, if you're doing random reads off a disk, it's incredibly slow compared to um, reading from memory. It's like 100,000 times slower, you know. Uh, and fairly recently, most of the database architectures I've looked at in any depth have actually just been serially reading from disk. You really, you know, you really want to, in one way or another, just cache as much as you can from the disk and pull it off that slow device and put it onto a fast device. Um, and there's a lot of smart things that you can do with that, but it's kind of over. And um, solid state um, disks or flash drives, really, is what they are. Uh, is very quickly replacing spinning disk. Um, uh, and that changes the game completely because the the way that data is organized on a disk is it's organized according to the way that the disk works. You know, so it's actually about a head moving across a spinning surface, actually multiple heads moving across multiple spinning surfaces uh, and picking up the data as they go. Um, a solid state drive is just a block of stuff that you can read, right? So, I mean, the first thing is that all the traditional databases were engineered for spinning disk, uh, and they're now being re-engineered for SSD. And new databases can probably, anybody that's writing a new database right now can probably ignore spinning disk, not think about it at all. Um, but um, Samsung, the, the major uh, manufacturer of SSDs, tells us that SSDs are actually on the Moore's Law curve. So, um, they were already, I think, about three or four times faster than spinning disk, but they're, they're now going to get um, a lot faster every 18 months, basically, um, doubling speed, and, and 10 times in speed after about six years. Um, if that was just it, however, um, um, that isn't it, as I shall tell you in a moment. Spinning disk, of course, is becoming an archiving medi medium. So, about memory. Um, first things first, RAM, you know, the CPU ratio um, between uh, RAM um, uh, per CPU is just increasing all the time. And that, of course, 
in a way delivers an awful lot more speed because the acres of memory that you can have now um, can store a lot more. What this actually does is it kind of reduces the pressure on OLTP kind of applications or random read applications because it's easy to cater those um, because you've now got a lot of memory and therefore you can cache anything that's likely to be read into memory. But you, you run into problems with the bigger data heap. So big data is actually not that simple really. Uh, and then we have Intel with 3D cross points. Uh, and IBM with what they call PCM, which is phase change memory, um, are delivering something that they believe is actually, well, it's at least 10 times faster than current SSDs. Uh, and they believe that it'll get very close to being the same speed as RAM. And of course, it's less expensive. So previously, you had this database structure of uh, CPU memory and um, uh, and disk, and now we're moving towards a structure that's got four layers, you know, it's got CPU, um, memory, or RAM, and then this kind of um, faster than SSD memory, which is exactly non-volatile, uh, and then SSD, you know. Uh, and these new technologies are non-volatile, and there's HP's uh, memory store, which is not yet um, you know, because it was announced about seven years ago, but it's not yet appeared. But um, the rumors that I hear is that HP is going to change the game a little bit with a memory store as well. So you've got just a new memory situation. This isn't like we've got faster stuff. This is like we've got a whole new layer, you know. Uh, and then we've got the fact that SSD assets, you can read it in parallel. You know, you can't read spinning disk in parallel except by having a lot of different spinning disks. But a block of SSD you can actually read in parallel. Uh, and because you can read that in parallel, it goes way faster than its simple read speeds if you actually set up multiple processes across the various um, uh, processes on a single CPU and just have at it with the um, uh, with the SSD. So. But it's estimated you can get almost up to RAM speeds by doing that. Um, and all that this is saying is, you know, this slide is saying, well, the future of memory architecture is unclear. I mean, the, the, the reality is that the, the various dominant vendors, whoever they turn out to be, will probably determine the direction of the hardware. But nobody knows where it's going at this point in time. Um, I have talked to some database engineers who say they're not afraid of what's happening, but uh, it, they don't know how to optimize it from the get-go. Uh, and you always kind of did, so that's interesting. And then there's a the CPU, you know. Well, multi-core multi CPUs weren't just multi-core CPUs. We also had significant volumes, uh, volumes of L1, L2, and L3 cache, particularly L3, which is up to, I don't know, tens of megabytes, you can put a lot there, you know, um, and therefore you can actually use the, the chip as a caching medium, so that changed the game. Uh, and certainly um, vector processing and data compression, um, a, lot, a number of vendors have actually done that, dragged that stuff onto the CPU to make it all go a lot faster at the CPU. Right? Then you get the fact that, well, CPUs with GPUs are, are really good at accelerating analytics, and they're really quite good at certain kinds of queries. It just depends upon what your query is. You know, so you could either create boards with CPUs and GPUs on, or as um, AMD are doing right now, you produce something called an APU, which is a kind of marriage of a CPU and a GPU. It's got both kinds of capability on it. Um, so that's a different kind of processor. Uh, and then the recent announcement by uh, Intel that they're going to put an FPGA on the chip, that just can, that kind of did my head in. I was thinking, oh, on the earth, is it going to happen? Because if you've got the possibility of CPU, GPU, and you've got the possibility of uh, CPU, FPGA, and by the way, if you really want to, on the same board, you could put a CPU and a GPU and an FPGA. Um, uh, I have no idea how you would actually run anything in that way, but I do know of companies that are doing things like this, uh, and they're getting very, very fast query responses. So, 
you know, this isn't something that's going to be ignored. This is something that's going to be used by the established vendors and by new vendors coming up, perhaps. Um, so DBMSs were always parallel, but now the parallel possibilities have just exploded because this allows you to parallelize this with that, with that, with that in various ways. Finally, to scale up or scale out. Scaling up. Um, it's really much better. Scaling up is the best solution, but for one thing, you know. So you get far better node performance if you can just absolutely optimize the performance of the CPU and the um, memory and the, uh, uh, and the disk on one node. And you will use fewer nodes, so it's going to be cheaper, right? And it'll be easier to manage. Unfortunately, it's a hardware-dependent design. And as hardware changes, it becomes less and less possible to do that, unless your engineers are going to be able to run as fast as um, the, the hardware is changing. And you do get workload issues, because when you're scaling up, you're making various assumptions about what workloads are going to do. If you scale out, <coughs> that is, if your architecture emphasizes scale out before scale up, actually, you've got to do them both. It's just, it's just that you, you emphasize one. Then you will get better network performance because the architecture will deal with it. It will be more expensive in the hardware terms because there will be more nodes. But there will be fewer workload issues, uh, and there will be more flexible design. Um, and I just thought I would throw that in because if you actually think of all the hardware changes I just pointed my finger at and then you thought about how you're going to scale up and scale out on that stuff, then you realize that um, database engineers are, in my opinion at least, well underpaid. Um, so if you just contemplate the hardware layer, the database challenges are clear. I can now pass this on to Bert who's going to... Um, make us all feel educated. <laughs> That's it, Bert. Thank you very much. Let me just get straight into these slides. I have a lot of slides to go through, so on quite a few of them, I may go rather quickly. We're going to be talking about this forward momentum, moving relational beyond traditional. It's not your father's database anymore. Things have changed, and as an earlier speaker said, the last six to seven years, the landscape has changed radically. Myself, I've uh, been doing databases since the mid-'80s. I've written books on Oracle, SQL Server, benchmarking, and quite a few other things. The world is changing very fast. Big will not beat, beat small anymore. It will be the fast beating the slow. I added the to adapt. That was from Rupert Murdoch. I really believe this is going to be true. You're not going to be able to do database stuff the way you did 10, 15, 20 years ago. You're going to have to do it the way the business wants it now. I'm going to try and stay a little generic in what I'm presenting, but most of the features I'm talking about you will find in Oracle, you will find in SQL Server, MySQL, MariahDB, and some of the other uh, big players. The relational database Revolution, I kind of, again, agree with the earlier speakers. If you look, right around 2010, we went from the red race car to the yellow race car. There was a significant change. And come 2020, I believe you're going to see another radical change. So we're in a very interesting time. Now, this slide is key. That's why I put a key up there. Uh, there's all this change going on. And on the left-hand side, I've got technology, and on the right-hand side, I've got business. And the question is, which one is causing which and which one is supporting which? Uh, so we have all this hardware changes, you know, disks coming down, disk size going up, new types of disk. So that was covered by the earlier speakers, the price of memory dropping, all these newer versions of databases. But on the right-hand side, we've got data protection and compliance, data warehousing, business intelligence, analytics, mandatory data retention. So both sides of the equation are driving, and both sides of the equation are going to make use of all these new features. First of all, we've got our typical SAS spinning disk. They're up to 10 terabytes now. If you've not seen, like uh, Western Digital, HGST has what they call their helium drive. Those go up to about 10 terabytes right now. Uh, the spinning disk costs are getting pretty low. As was mentioned earlier, you can get solid state disks up to about two terabytes, but uh, Samsung has a 20 terabyte unit coming soon. 
uh, the costs are becoming reasonable. Uh, one thing I am going to talk about the others didn't is the concept of flash disks, uh, PCIe, that's PCI Express versus NVMe. You may or may not have heard of this, non-volatile memory express. Basically, NVMe is going to be a replacement for SAS and SATA, and it's really more of a communication protocol than uh, than anything else. But those disks are up to about three terabytes now. You also may have seen that some SAS drives now come with U2 connectors, which is sort of uh, a different connector than a SAS or SATA that supports NVMe with a standard disk. Uh, the disk has to support it as well, of course. And then SATA with M2 connectors, and those are starting to get NVMe. In fact, there are uh, notebook vendors now selling notebooks that have an NVMe flash disk in it, and those things will scream compared to the technology you've used before. A lot of people don't know what all these different flashes are. Uh, if you look in the bottom right corner, that's an example of an M2. Uh, you may say, well, gee, it looks a lot like an M SATA drive to the left of it, but as you can see, it's got two uh, gaps in the pins as opposed to one, uh, and it is a little bit bigger. And also, the M2 can come in three different sizes. And then the PCI Express flash and the NVMe flash. Now, the NVMe flash is also PCI Express, but the PCI Express is typically still a SAS or SATA type con controller algorithm that was written for spinning disk, and NVMe is the algorithms or techniques that were written specifically for flash. And again, you're going to be seeing all of these. NVMe offers quite a few things. I think the two biggest improvements are up in the top right corner, the latency is reduced by as much as 70%. I've actually seen even higher than that. In addition, if you look in the bottom right corner, when your operating system talks to the NVMe disk, it goes through far fewer levels of software. It basically, you go through the NVMe driver that's included now with the operating system, and it talks straight to the media. So there's a lot of reasons why this technology is going to radically uh, change the database world. And a lot of times people will say, well, how fast is NVMe? You know, in the good old days back 2004 beyond, and before, you know, we, we got excited if we had uh, Ultra 320 SCSI, 300 megabytes per second. You know, today's speeds, you know, a lot of you are probably in fiber or InfiniBand, and those kind of top out. NVMe over there on the right, starts at where the current technologies end. What I'm getting at is PCI Express 3.0 with an eight-lane link starts at almost 8,000, and it will go up as we get newer versions of PCI Express, uh, versions 4 and so on. So NVMe has nowhere to go except up. Now, what are some of the things changing in the database? Now, in the top right corners of my slides, I put the business reasons I think the technology showed up. So in this case, because of data warehousing and because of regulatory reasons for mandatory data retention, the databases are starting to offer compression in them. Now, some databases offer compression uh, as an add-on. Some offer it as built into the standard, let's say, enterprise edition of their database. And yet, some databases, like an Oracle, could even have an even better version of compression that's in, say, their Exadata platform. So they've actually built hardware that can support a very specialized uh, compression. And that one in Exadata, for example, gets a 40x compression rate. And so it's very significant. And I think it's the mandatory data retention. People just want data longer. The businesses, in order to do analytics and BI, they need the last 5, 10, 15 years worth of data. Now another feature that started showing up right around that 2008-2009 uh, period was partitioning. Again, you will find this in databases like Oracle, SQL Server, and in both of those, you know, you have to pay for it. In Oracle, you have to buy the partitioning option, and in SQL Server, you have to be in the data center edition. It's your traditional divide and conquer technique. And what you do is you have the concept of a logical big table at the top there. And when it gets put on disk, it actually is broken up into buckets. And you can see that those buckets are organized by some criteria for separating. 
typically referenced or called your partitioning function. And then likewise, you can also subpartition in some database platforms and you can go even further. Again, I think both data warehousing and the mandatory data retention have pushed this. Uh, and in some of these databases, you can have up to 64,000 partitions, and I believe on some of the databases, even up to 64,000 subpartitions. So this allows you to break up your data into manageable pieces. You also will partition the indexes. Uh, it's an option, you don't have to, but you can partition your indexes as well. One of the reasons to do this might be that you have a sliding window of data. You want to keep 10 years worth of data, but in order to drop the indexes to run tonight's batch load, you don't want to have to drop the indexes on every single row, only on the rows that are in the current bucket. So partitioning is actually a very good administrative tool, even though most people think that its great benefit is for doing partition elimination in your plans and, and therefore speeding up your queries. That's really kind of icing on the cake. Now, you've probably heard about sharding, and you probably think, well, why did you put that slide in here? This is one of those NoSQL, uh, this is one of those uh, you know, Hadoop-type environments. Oracle uh, 12C Release 2, which is not GA'd yet, but which is being shown or previewed, actually has sharding in it. So you're going to have a traditional relational database system like Oracle, and you're going to be able to shard like you do in the Hadoop model. And so you're going to have another divide and conquer technique. It's going to split your table row-wise into groupings per node. And this is going to be just like what you see in some of your NoSQL databases. Uh, and actually, uh, MySQL, you can actually accomplish this a little, pretty much using one of their clustering techniques. But it is coming to a traditional database, and my guess is uh, Microsoft won't want to get left behind. These two play leapfrog with each other all the time, so I would expect to see sharding in maybe the next version of SQL Server. Data lifecycle management. Again, mandatory data retention, but also for business inte uh, intelligence and analytics. Really, this is a divide and conquer technique, and typically DBAs do this manually, and that is, I'm going to keep this year's data on fast disk, last year's data on slightly slower disk. Maybe I'm going to keep the last, uh, the two years before that on even slower disk, and then I'll have some archival method. It's typically not tape anymore. It's typically you've got some kind of uh, network attached storage or some device that has lots of storage and is, you know, cost effective, but it's still spinning disk. And so, now you can actually, both in Oracle and in SQL Server, you can purchase an option where you define the rules and this just happens automagically in the background. You don't have to write scripts anymore, you don't have to do anything. And if you've seen uh, SQL Server 2016, which just came out June 1st, there's a new feature in it called Stretch Databases, which basically lets you do, uh, in the bottom right corner there, you can move from multiple layers directly into the cloud and again, this is a feature that's built into the database. You just say something like, if the data is more than 365 days old, please move it into the cloud and, you know, do it automatically for me. So this is going to be a really cool feature. In fact, I'm thinking that it may be what we're going to see in the future, which is you're going to have hybrid databases where you're going to keep some local and some in the cloud. You know, before this, people were thinking, oh, I'm either going to do on-premise or I'm going to do in the cloud. Now we're seeing the marriage of the two technologies in this hybrid fashion. I think this will be pretty big. And Microsoft got there first. Redaction. This is due to data protection and compliance. Now, in the good old days, we might have said, uh, hey, application developer, when you display this in a report or you display this on the screen, here are some security things you should check and please, you know, only show the data they're supposed to see or mask or redact data that they're not supposed to see. Well, as is usual, when you push it out to the application, it's not done in one place, so it gets done differently or it doesn't get done in some places. And so now you've actually got this capability in your database systems. Now, in SQL Server 2016, this feature is built in, so it's not an optional uh, cost item. Uh, you have to be on the data center edition, I believe. 
And in Oracle 12, you have to buy their lifecycle management add-on. But this is something new. And again, it's being driven by the business, uh, and especially because you're keeping so much data now and you're doing the data mining and you're, you know, the, so the BI and the analytics, you've got to know who's accessing what data and making sure that they're only allowed to see what they're allowed to see. Likewise, again, look at that, data protection and compliance. You will find that a lot of the database systems now are building compression, or I'm, I'm sorry, encryption directly into the database. And what's important about this encryption, if you look at the down arrow and the up arrow on the diagram, it writes it down to disk encrypted, and then it reads it back up into memory and decrypts it. That's actually one model. There's another model that would, uh, you know, actually only do it when it communicates that data across the network to the actual client application. So in that case, it would even still on the database server in memory, it could be encrypted and only decrypted when it's sent over to the client application. So there's two different models here, and you will find these in the databases. And in fact, one of the databases that just added this recently was MariahDB in their version 10.x. I believe they're on 10.1 or 10.2 now. And I actually did some benchmarking on this encryption. And in order to get this encryption, I only experienced about an 8% decrease in throughput or speed. So in a benchmarking test, the encryption did not cost that much. And so it's a very useful feature. Now, we had mentioned earlier about flash memory and SSDs and things like that. One of the features you have in Oracle and SQL Server that a lot of people don't realize is you can take a flash or SSD that's on your database server, and you can say to the database, use this as if though it were memory. Treat the RAM as preferential, but pretend like this is slow memory, and use that as an extended cache. Now, in SQL Server 2014, this came out. It was called Buffer Pool Extension. It's free. And Oracle, it came out in 11GR2, and it was called Database Flash Cache, and it's also free there. My advice, though, is to drive this, uh, test drive this feature carefully. Every time you make the cache bigger, when you go to do a lookup, it takes longer. So if you put a three terabyte flash card and say to the database, you know, add that to your memory, you actually might find that some things slow down because of the time to look and, and see, is it in flash, is it a dirty or clean? So there is a point of diminishing return. My advice is, again, test drive this, see what works for you. But again, it's in your database, and in the case of Oracle, it's in both SQL Server and Oracle, it's been there for a couple of years now. And then that brings us to the granddaddy, which was the in-memory databases, and that's because the database prices have dropped. The other reason that you probably would think that this has occurred is a lot of the analytics is requiring having the data be very quickly accessible, and so it needs to be in memory. Um, do note that the algorithms that the databases use to access this data, to compress it, to encrypt it, to store it, you know, in some cases, some databases may continue to store in memory as a row. Uh, in some cases, some databases may break this into a column oriented. Uh, and the reason they do that is they get a much higher compression level, somewhere around the 11 to 12 X by storing it in column order versus row order. Uh, this first showed up in SQL Server 2014. It was called Hecaton. It's been radically increased in SQL Server 2016. You'll see it referenced by some different names. And it came out in Oracle 12C. I say the second release here, not R2. There were two different releases of uh, Oracle 12C, uh, the 12.101 and the 12.102. Uh, so it's the second release of the R1 version of the database. And the way that you define an in-memory object is uh, similar in both databases. So here you can see on the right top corner, I'm creating a SQL server, and you can see it says with memory optimized and durability being schema only. I'm not going to go over all the syntax meanings. And with Oracle, it's actually even simpler. You just alter a table and say in-memory or not. Uh, and you can change that. I can say today it's in memory and tomorrow it's not. 
and so it's very flexible. I did some tests on Oracle within memory tables. I had some tests that took almost 46 minutes to run up there in the top row. And what's important is by the time I got to the bottom two rows, I had increased the run time or decreased it, I should say, uh, to five minutes approximately. And when I looked at the compression factor, the data in memory was actually 3.6 to 4.6 times smaller. Now that's important because in this case I was using column-oriented format and its compression. And so guess what? I actually was fitting almost four to five times as much data in my memory. So not only was I getting the advantage of in memory, the advantage of it column oriented, but also the advantage of far more data, you know, up to five times as much data in the memory cache. So this is a pretty powerful technique. Again, Oracle and SQL Server, you want to look at these. They're really cool features. And with that, I think I'll open it up to questions. Well, Bert, first of all, you've been very selfless in all this wonderful education. Could you talk just for a minute about what you guys do? Because you've got some enabling technology that can facilitate what you've been talking about. Just talk for a minute about what you guys do, and then let's get Des and Robin in, in the equation here. Yeah, uh, I work for a company called IDERA. We're in Texas. We're headquartered in Houston, and I'm actually sitting in Austin right now, but I'm based in Dallas. Uh, we make database tools, and we make database tools to help you solve problems. That problem could be something as simple as productivity, in which case we have a tool called DB Artisan that lets you uh, do your database administrative tasks, and it's one tool to let you manage 12 different database platforms. I can manage SQL Server, I can manage Oracle, I can manage MySQL, DB2, Postgres, and I'm using one tool, one executable, one GUI design, and one consistent set of workflows. We also make tools to do um, compliance. We have a tool called SQL Compliance Manager to help you meet your compliance needs. Another tool called SQL Security. Um, so we, we try to make the tools that will help you be effective and efficient. And what's really nice, if you go to our website, we have a whole bunch of freeware out there. So if nothing else, go download. I think we've got like 20 or 25 freewares. There's some really good freeware stuff out there, like there's a, a SQL Server and a Windows uh, health check that will just basically look at what you've got and tell you whether you've got issues or things, and it's totally free. So yeah, and you're definitely really look at our stuff. Yeah, you're, you're speaking to the heterogeneity of the marketplace today. You know, it used to be kind of a one-size-fits-all equation. In fact, I remember interviewing Dr. Michael Stonebreaker way back when in 2005 as he went on a big push talking about Vertica and the column-oriented database movement. And he was talking all about how the one-size-fits-all relational model dominated for many years, and he was predicting that would all change, and boy, was he right about that. So now we have this really diverse and interesting environment with lots of different options and opportunities, but you do need some way to manage all of that. And it seems to me that uh, your company is focused pretty acutely on solving that problem, thus being an enabler of the heterogeneity, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's always going to be DBAs who say, I don't want to use a GUI tool. I do everything with scripts. You know, they, they think they're the Superman type of DBA, and that's fine. But for most of us people, we want to just get work done. And, you know, I use Microsoft Word to write my documents. You know, I use Microsoft Outlook to do my email. I mean, I have tools for doing tasks. We're building the same kind of concept. We're building tools for database administrators and developers to help them focus on what they want to do and not how they have to do it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, let me turn you over to our experts and folks. Feel free to dive in. We've got a couple of comments coming in from the audience. Maybe Des, a couple of questions, and then Robin, a couple of questions. Sure. I, uh, one of the first questions I want to throw at you, given the um, enormous uh, uh, span of experience you've had, is do you see a point in time soon when any of this is going to slow down, or do you think we're really just at the, the, the entry point of this uh, continual growth line of change? I, I think one of the greatest issues that companies are facing and then invariably the people trying to support the technology uh, being provided those companies to, to run their businesses is that the rate of change is so dramatic that, you know, they, they just can't keep up with all the different features and all in software and systems and frameworks and architectures and 
new code coming out and then the hardware underneath that. Do you see the, the current rate of change slowing down at all uh, immediately? I mean, you, you deal with such a, a wide range of platforms with, with the, the entire idea of suite. Are we going to slow down soon, or are we sort of on this crazy runaway freight train for a long time yet? I, I think we're at the first 20% of that growth curve, and we've got a long way to go. And, and there are two things pushing it. You know, the technology keeps evolving. You had mentioned some of the new memory types that are going to be coming out, and that's going to be fantastic. You know, Samsung is going to have a 20 terabyte flash drive here real soon. That's going to change things. We've got all these NoSQL and cloud databases. This is just going to keep going. The one thing that's kind of funny, though, is when I look at databases like Oracle and SQL Server and some of the others, they're really not relational databases anymore. I can put unstructured data into Oracle and yet maintain ACID compliance. If you had told me that 20 years ago, I'd have said you were on drugs. Yeah, yeah, fair call. Um, well, you know, even now the engines that have got um, quite nice niche verticals like GIS that just as a native capability now. The, you, you made some great comments about the uh, challenges that the DBAs are facing and the different types of DBAs that we sort of see around the place. Um, what, what's the world looking like with the, the sort of that layer of the business that you're dealing with? I mean, these are people who use your, your different platforms from your, you know, your diagnostic manager to the inventory tools and all the way down to the, the, the low end sort of defragging. How, how are DBAs coping with this change and, and how do they sort of, you know, what, what are they doing with your tools to kind of deal with this, this significant shift in their landscape? Well, I'm going to go back almost 20 years ago, and I'm going to say that DBAs filled a very specific role in an organization. They typically worked with one database platform, maybe two, and they managed a relatively small number of databases. Now, fast forward to today, and the database administrator, he's actually got to know 10 database platforms, he's managing, and this is no joke, in some cases, thousands of databases. Uh, that's more in the SQL Server world or the MySQL world, you know, but still, even in the Oracle world, they could be managing hundreds of databases. And so they've got all these new features coming out, they've got all these new platforms, and they've got all these databases they're responsible for. Uh, they're looking for tools to enable their productivity and also to help them learn some things. And I, I'll give you an example. If I want to partition a table, it's some pretty obscure syntax. And if I want to subpartition it, the, the syntax gets even more difficult. I know what I want to do. I want to create buckets. So if I've got a tool like DB Artisan that says, hey, here's a nice screen you know, that lets you concentrate on what you're trying to do rather than how you're trying to do it. And oh, by the way, push the show SQL button when you're done, and we'll show you what the SQL was so you can start to really learn and master this. You know, so the DBAs are finding that tools that help them get the job done but also help teach them all this new stuff that they're using. And the same would be true, let's say I'm an Oracle guy and I go over to MySQL and I say, okay, create a database, DB Artisan. Now show me the SQL because I wonder what it is like to create a database in MySQL and I just learned a syntax. And so we're not only helping them to work cross database, we're also educating them cross database. The, 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 it gets even more interesting when you get out to some of the more, more modern, um, well, not more modern, that's not, not, not a fair thing to say, but um, you know, once upon a time a database is a database, but these days it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, I see everything you're talking about there uh, with the added challenge that the, the technology stacks that we've traditionally seen from vendors, you know, and you throw open source into it, and all of a sudden that you know they've got to not just deal with the database engines and the query language, but they've also got to deal with the data types and the structured, unstructured, and you know the the challenge of having to deal with everything from the far end of the spectrum of a, of a multi petabyte HDFS environment to little tiny Tokyo containers and and, and you know packet files and, and and various log file formats. Um, and I think that that's something now we're seeing where just no human being, no matter how much of a superman, superwoman, whatever they might think they are, they physically just can't and mentally deal with that, that um, rate of change in the scale of variations. I think um, the suite of tools that you're offering now are going to get to the point where they, they almost become a default fait accompli in many ways so that we can't run the database environments we've got without them uh, because we just physically can't throw that many bodies at them. So I've really enjoyed your presentation today. I'm going to pass to Dr. Robin Blore because I'm sure he's got plenty of questions to throw at you as well.
Okay, well, I certainly have questions. But um, I thought, I don't know whether you, I, mean, I had a really interesting conversation a couple of days ago by someone who started telling me about the latest EU data protection. Um, and it seemed to me, from what they were saying, that it was um, uh, incredibly draconian in terms of the things that it insisted on. I wondered if you'd actually looked at that. Is it is it something you're familiar with? It's um, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Tell us about it. And I, I, I've I actually it's deeply interesting. I actually worked for a while for a flash vendor uh, in their database area, helping them build flash products for databases. And I can tell you that. The draconian goes all the way down. What I mean is, if you remember my one slide, I said in some databases it'll do the encryption, but it you know, puts it into the server memory. And in some databases, the encryption, it, it's still encrypted in the server memory. It only gets decrypted when it gets sent to the client. Well, what you'll also find is some of these government standards, especially uh, Department of Defense or military here in the U.S., they also go all the way down to the flash level, and they want to know not only that you support encryption and decryption in your hardware, but that if someone stole the chips that, you know, pulled them out of the thing, out of your server, that what's there is encrypted. And so even though they've got the storage, uh, it can't be. And, and they were all the way down to the actual, not to the flash part itself, but down to the individual chips. They wanted to know that chip by chip, everything was, you know, encrypted. Wow. So, I mean, there, there are a lot of things that, you know, I think it was only one or two slides that you brought up about this, but it was something, it's an area that I think is really interesting. The redacting of information, for instance, has got to be a, a little bit clever than just, uh, than just masking off various um, fields because, with, especially with machine learning nowadays, you can do deductive things that allows you to surface information that you couldn't previously surface. You know, so if you're trying to protect, let's say, health information, then um, the, that's a very, very draconian rules in the U.S. as regards health information. Um, but you can actually, using various machine learning techniques, you can often work out who somebody's, you know, who somebody's medical information actually is. I just wondered if you've got anything to say about that, because I also think that's an interesting area. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just using this as an example. I'm not trying to, you know, say one database is better than another, but th this is a very good example for what you just asked. In Oracle, if I am not allowed to see a row of data, for example, like, you know, I'm not allowed to see the John Smith uh, medical record. In Oracle, if I say select that record, I'll be blocked or I'll be allowed to see what I'm allowed to see and it'll be redacted. And, and if I say select count star from the table where equals John Smith, I'll get zero. In SQL Server, it can do the redaction, but it has some holes. So if I say select star, count star from the table where it equals John Smith, I'll actually get back a one. So I know there's a John Smith. So one, one is more secure than the other. Now I, I expect them to fix that. You know, they always play leapfrog with each other. And again, I'm not trying to differentiate between the databases other than to show an example of look at, look at what we're talking about now. You know, something as simple as a select count has to also be caught by the redaction, even though, technically speaking, there's nothing being redacted other than the existence of the row. Yeah, right. That's kind of interesting. Well, I mean, another general question, because we haven't got a lot of time, is really just about the improvements. I mean, you've been, in one way or another, you've been showing us um, uh, examples of various test results you've you've run. Do you think that the um, the traditional databases, let's call them the dominant databases, SQL Server and Oracle, do you think they're going to stay ahead of the competition, or do you think that they're actually going to get caught by one or another of um, various kinds of um, disruptions in the marketplace that really wrong foot them? What's your opinion? I have an opinion, and, and it's, you know, so again, I'm going to say it's my opinion. Microsoft, for example, in the post-bomber era, is just impressing the living hell out of me. I mean, this stretch database, getting SQL Server on Linux, getting, you know, uh, .NET over on Linux, getting PowerShell over on Linux. I don't think that 
traditional database vendor is going to get left behind. I think they've decided, hey, let the new guys, you know, the startups, define something. Let them figure out what sharding is and who, how it should be perfected. And once they've done all the research and development and we know exactly what users want, now let's add sharding to Oracle. I think they're just getting smart and, and saying, hey, being second or third is not bad when you're the dominant player because then people won't migrate off of you. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a strategy that, that's been used. I mean, IBM used to do that um, in the whole of the, um, for the whole of their product ranges. Uh, and it does work reasonably well until somebody comes up with something that's just completely off the wall that nobody had ever thought of. But you can't plan against that anyway. Um, questions from the audience, Eric? Yeah, we've got time, I think, just for one maybe. And I know that uh, Bert has to run. There was something in here about, um, okay, the sharding architecture on Oracle 12C, uh, is that an indication of, or what is that an indication of in your opinion? What, what do you think is happening there? Well, Oracle is absorbing or, and offering everything that all the da other database vendors are. For example, I can put unstructured data in Oracle. I don't know how you can put unstructured data and then call it a relational database. It doesn't make any sense, but, it, but you can. And now Oracle is adding sharding. You, you know, so Oracle is saying, you know what? Whatever the market wants, we will make our database offer uh, because the market wants what the market wants and we want to deliver the solution. We want them to stay with us. I think that you're going to see additional items. I would not be surprised to see Hadoop-like clustering of database nodes, in a, not in an Oracle rack or real application cluster, but basically in more of a traditional Hadoop-type clustering, doing that sharding. And so I think you'll be able to deploy a database like Oracle like you would a Hadoop. And, and these kind of trends are going to continue. The, these big database vendors, you know, they make billions of dollars and they don't want to lose their market. So if <laughs> they're willing to adapt anything or adopt anything. Well, you know, it's funny because I've followed the open source movement for quite some time and have wondered all that while how big an impact it will have on traditional closed source technology. And for a while, it sure felt like the open source vendors were making some serious headway. And now as I look at the marketplace, I see kind of what you're seeing, that the big guys have done their math, have sharpened their pencils, and have figured out how they can weave a lot of that stuff into their architectures, whether it's IBM or Oracle or SAP. I was just at the Sapphire Now conference last month, and uh, Steve Lucas, who heads up half that company, bragged that SAP now incorporates in their HANA Cloud platform more open source components than any of their competitors. If you do the math on that, it's a pretty impressive statement, and it tells me that uh, the big guys aren't going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> No, I, I would bet money on both. I mean, if you look, Microsoft stock recently was at about $50, and, you know, just a few years ago it was at 25 you, you don't double your stock price in a short period unless you're doing good things. And, uh, you know, from doing everything from Windows 10 being free for the first year to all the other smart things they're doing, this stretch database feature, I think, is just phenomenal. I think what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to end up in Azure, not directly, not like they said, let's migrate my database over to Azure. It's going to migrate over there magically because it's going to get archived over there using this new stretch database feature. And so the adoption of, of Azure is going to just skyrocket. Well, and that's one of the trends in the marketplace that I even see, even on your Mac. As you go on your Mac to save some document, they now in the newer Macs default to the cloud, right? I mean, it, they're there's a lot of sense in that strategy, and I also look at it and go, okay, guys, you're trying to lure me piece by piece into your cloud environment, and then someday when I want to watch some movie, if my credit card has expired, I'm going to be in trouble. And, yeah, but uh, you do it on Facebook. Yeah, that's true. You put everything on Facebook. Well, uh, not quite everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah, go these, ahead. these social trends are reaching into businesses. Now, businesses still have a lot of other things they have to do, but they're seeing these trends, and they're doing the same kinds of things. I, I don't see either Oracle or Microsoft going away. In fact, you know, I'm going to be buying stock on both each time there's a dip. Yes, indeed. Well, folks, go to idera.com, I-D-E-R-A.com. Like uh, Bert said, they have a whole bunch of free stuff up there. 
That is one of the new trends in the marketplace, give you some free stuff to play around with, get you hooked, and then you go buy the real stuff. Folks, this has been another hot technology. Thanks for your time today, Bert, Des, of course, and Robin as well. We'll talk to you next week, folks. Lots of stuff going on. If you have any ideas, feel free to email yours truly, info at insideanalysis.com. We'll talk to you next time, folks. Take care. Bye-bye.